and gentlemen, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in New I know. Well, they, they'll turn it on in a second. What's one of the beautiful things about being able to project? Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, once again, we're going to follow the standard procedure, but I'm going to go over it anyway. Still photos, no video, please, here in the room. I uh, would really appreciate it if you would turn off your cell phone ringer. Uh, r please raise your hand. I will call on you in the order I see you. I have to take notes in the order I see you. Uh, please wait for the microphone. We will get the microphone. Uh, to you. When you get the microphone, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to interrupt you and ask you to identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, Tony, Aaron, and Les will be taking care of the quotes from the press conference, and we'll get them uh, out to the media uh, shortly after the conclusion. Uh, the, what we're going to be, be doing is the first part of the press conference is going to be the student athletes and Coach Beard up here all at once. That will stop at 3.10, at which point the student athletes will go to the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms are located down on the other side of the building, uh, close to the Zamboni entrance, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the student athletes will be in these rooms as follows. Room one will be Jarrett Culver. Room two, Norenzo Diasi. Room three, Tariq Owens. Room four, Matt Mooney. And room five, Davide Moretti. Any questions? Okay. The locker room will also be open uh, when the press conference starts up. Uh, as you ask questions, we're going to please, if there's anything you want to do with the student athletes, please ask them first. And uh, if you have a question that you'd like more than one person to answer, really appreciate it if you would direct it at one individual and, instead of just for anybody, because otherwise I'm going to pick who's going to answer, and that may not get you the answer you want. Go ahead. So Texas Tech is in the locker room. They will be here momentarily. They're on this side, so it's a short walk. All right, we'll start off with uh, just an opening statement from Coach Beard, if there's anything you want to say, and then we'll open up the questions. Hey, guys, Culver's here. I'd like to speak for everybody in our program, um, how much respect we have for Gonzaga. You know, in our third year of building the tech program, we talked a lot about consistency, and we 
use the word program a lot. We don't want to just be a, a, a organization that has really one good season or one good team. We want to be a program. That word means everything in college basketball. And I think Gonzaga has done this over many years with consistency. Uh, the roster changes, but the level of excellence stays the same. So they have the kind of program that we're trying to build at Tech. So we have a lot of respect for them. Simply stated, we think they're one of the best teams in college basketball. Uh, we think we'll have to play our best 40 minutes of the year to this point to advance. And so that's our objective. All right, so we'll open up to questions. Please raise your hand. I'll call on you in the order that I see you. We'll go right there in the fourth row, please. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News for Norenz and for Jarrett. Last year you were at this stage against Villanova. What do you remember about that experience? How much has that motivated you? And what have you learned from that, you know, over the last 12 months? They were. When you get to this stage, the Elite Eight, every team's good. Every team's great. Uh, we just know that this year is going to be different. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, Preparation-wise, we'll be prepared as always. Uh, we know what to expect at this level, uh, relaying it to the new guys. Um, just bringing that fight, that toughness that fueled us this summer uh, from day one when we started training, knowing that we looked at that Villanova loss and everything that we did. Uh, we changed a lot of things scheme-wise. Uh, just try to get better from that loss, and it's gotten us to this point. So we just got to keep on, keep on with those principles that's got us here every day, the workness, the toughness, just things like that to the day-to-day the day -to -day process that's got us here, and it's got to continue. Tariq, do you want to answer that? Oh, sorry, Jared, my bad. Yeah, like everything Norris was saying, and I mean, just having that feeling in the locker room of getting so close to the Final Four and losing and – I mean, we worked for it all summer, not to have that feeling again. So, I mean, we're at the point where we're back to the Elite Eight. And, I mean, it's, it's great. I just feel like we don't want to have that feeling again of losing. Jerk, can we get you to angle that mic up a little closer to your mouth there? Just make sure we can hear you. Okay, uh, next question. We're going to in the very back in the glasses right there. Uh, Kurt Bromister, TSN from Upman, Canada. Uh, coach and any of the players who want to uh, take this one as well. Uh, I, d I don't know how much you've seen of Gonzaga, but Brandon Clark past couple games has, has a, had a couple good ones. I know you guys, obviously, your defense was really strong and shut down uh, Michigan down low and a lot of other places too. Uh, how much have you seen of Brandon Clark and, and any idea how you guys will try and stop him with his momentum he's currently got going? Yeah, we've seen a lot of him. He's uh, one of the best players in college basketball. I think to say that he's just an athlete is incorrect. He does a lot of things on uh, both ends of the floor. We, we've told our guys this morning he's a great basketball player. So we face guys like this in the Big 12 during our 18-round fight. Uh, we'll have to play really well against him. In terms of game plan, um, if you guys don't mind, we'll probably keep that to ourselves and uh, hopefully have a chance to talk to you about it after the game. Any of the players want to address Brandon Clark? All right, we'll go to our next question uh, in the peach, it looks like. Go ahead. Joe Reedy, Associated Press. For Chris and for Matt, most efficient offense versus the most efficient defense. In terms of Gonzaga, can you compare them to any teams you faced this year? Um, yeah, they're really good offensively, um, and we're really good defensively, so uh, we'll see who wins out. I know. I don't know who to compare them to. I know Duke was, you know, played really fast. I know Gonzaga plays really fast. Um, so I know we're gonna have to get back in on defense, for sure. Anybody else have any comparisons? Nope. Okay. Any more questions? Right here in the third row, please. Jackson Frank, Gonzaga Bulletin. This one's for Jarrett. I know you pretty radically changed your, your shot mechanics over the last year. I was wondering what went into that decision making and what was that process like to kind of adjust to a new a new shot? Uh, just to be more efficient on my shot. And I mean, the coaching staff and a lot of the GAs and people have helped me come a long way with my shot. So I mean, I just got to work with it over the summer. I started way back in the summer, just working on technique just to be a better shooter. So, I mean, it's always ways you can improve on your game, and that was one of the ways I improved. Right here in the white, in the third row. 
Two for me when LA Daily News. Coach, we mentioned kind of the efficiency that Gonzaga plays with on offense. What makes that offense so so dangerous and so difficult to go, to go against? I think two things. One, the talent. You know, I several NBA players on this roster, obviously. Um, they're really good. So for us, it's what it's like every night in the Big 12. You're playing against NBA players. Um, not a lot of one-dimensional guys either, guys that can do different things. And then two, you know, great coaching. There's a lot of teams around the country that have great players and they're watching these games on TV. Um, and there's a lot of really good coaches around the country. They're also watching the games on TV. But when you combine the two like Gonzaga does, a big, big time coach um, and great players, NBA talent, then, you know, you're one of the last teams standing. Coach, can you talk a little bit about what the process is like after a game last night? Obviously, you've, you're used to playing games on, uh, or when you're on in the conference, but a game last night where you're at this level, what do you and the coaching staff do to get ready for tomorrow's games? Yeah, we just try to stay true to who we are. Uh, we find ourselves in this situation a lot in the Big 12 where we'll play a Saturday game, then we'll play a big Monday. So we call it a one-day prep. We also... Uh, schedule these type of situations on purpose to put our guys in different situations, whether it be back-to-backs or one-day preps or two days. So uh, really, we just stay true. We, we get back, we immediately try to hydrate and feed the guys and get some rest. We spend a couple minutes talking about the last game, um, kind of putting that to sleep, the good things, the things we got to do better. And then we try to uh, introduce the next opponent, personnel base first, then we start getting into game plan. But um, well, it's hard to believe, but we're really kind of doing the same things we've always done. We, we recognize we're on the biggest stage and we're having a lot of fun here, but we just got to be who we are. It's really important, I think, is to continue to be who we are. Question in the back in the green. Coach, obviously, um, when you get to this point Can in the tournament. Can you identify yourself? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Khalil Cage, CBS Sports. Um, when you get to this point in the tournament, obviously the media increases and it comes, you know, with the territory. How do you balance the media obligations that you have to do on your one day to prep for a chance at the Final Four and still, you know, stay focused at the task at hand? Yeah, these guys to my left, they're all veterans. These are experienced people. I don't worry about that one bit. This team led by Norrance and our other three seniors, have uh, they've embraced the idea of eliminating distractions from day one whether it be social media or turning your phone off at night or a, a girlfriend from time to time. Is Moro still in love? Nope. Um, you know, family and friends, ticket requests, these things. We spend a lot of time talking about eliminating distractions. That ultimately what successful people do, not just basketball. You know, successful people know what's important and they can eliminate the things that aren't important. So with the players, I really don't have any concern on that. And me personally, I just – I do what Wes Bloomquist, our SID, tells us to do. Wes is a D2 guy, by the way. Some people didn't think he could handle this stage, but I think he's doing a pretty good job his first year. What do you guys think, man? Great thing to happen, Coach. How are you? Uh, <laughs> you got to love the shout-out for the SID. As a former SID, I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions? Right here. We'll go here, and then we'll go in the back. Jackson Frank, Gonzaga Bolton. This is for uh, Coach Ernie. Any player besides Jarrett? Uh, Jarrett last year played a pretty big role, but wasn't like the, wasn't a Big 12 player of the year. I'm curious where you all have seen the biggest jump in his game to, to get to the point where he is now. You want to take that one, Morrow? Culver's improvement from year one, from young Culver to middle-aged Culver. Yeah, I think he every time he should, trying to do a shooting competition with me, and he always lost, so he's trying to like you know. <laughs> Prove me wrong every time, and he's trying to get sh get some more shots up after the every practice. So I think he, he's getting better. Anybody else want in on that? It's your chance, man. Three, get on Culver a little bit. No, I mean since I've gotten here, I mean Culver's been great. He puts in a lot of work. Um, I mean I can vouch for the losses that and the shooting drills. I'm just saying, but I mean. Culver's just a great, he's just great, man. He puts in a lot of work. Uh, I mean, he's earned everything that he's, all the accolades he's getting now, he's earned every bit of it. All right, we'll go here in the green. In the Chris, uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Chris, I wanted to go back to what, something Norentz had said that, you know, after the Villanova game, maybe was there some sort of taking stock in how you played it all or ch changing the 
way you played in maybe in subtle subtle ways? Yeah, I agree with uh, Norris. We, we were always trying to learn from victory and defeat. A lot of the things we do in our program are from different people. Uh, you know, from the Villanova game, we try to get the Villanova jump stop. We thought Brunson was the best we ever saw in person. We spent a lot of time on that. Culver added that to his game, more old than that. Um, you know, they, they do a lot of things. So, um, absolutely, we talked about that game all summer and all offseason, just like we're still talking about the West Virginia game where we got beat in the Big 12 tournament. We, we always try to learn from every uh, success and defeat. Did you have a follow-up? Okay. We'll go to Joe, and then we'll go to the back corner there. Joe Reedy, Associated Press. Chris, after viewing the film of last night's game, you think that's one of the best defensive games you guys have had this season? Yeah, I would agree with that, one of. Um, you know, as coaches, we always kind of strive for perfection. You know, I'm never satisfied. These guys to my left understand that. And the best thing about coaching these guys is they're, they share the same way. You know, like um, – I've seen us play really, really good games before. Then Norris will be getting on guys during timeouts. Uh, we just have a standard, you know. We try not to play for the scoreboard or even the result. We try to just play each possession the best we can. So last night, I'll say this, the guys were dialed in. These seniors had the team ready to play. Um, I think it was some from our respect of Michigan. Um, we were fortunate they missed uh, a lot of shots they normally make. But I think you got to give our guys credit for challenging those coach uh, those shots and making those shots contested. Uh, but yeah, there's no doubt about it. We played well last night, obviously. I tell the guys all the time, you know, you, it sounds like Captain Obvious, but like you, you got to play well. Like You got to play well to win games in this tournament. And so here's the next step. Gonzaga, in our opinion, the best team we played this year. No disrespect to anyone else. Uh, we'll have to play our best game. We're going to go all the way in the back corner there, in the white. A uh, question for Matt. This is Reed Forgrave with oh, uh, CBS Sports. Um, you're wearing the T-shirt that says "Never lose the chip." You guys have this mantra: uh, "Secrets in the dirt." I'm curious, like behind these cliches, like what what is the real, deep down identity of that this team, and, and how does that come about over the course of a season when you have so many new players? Yeah, I think um, you know we have a lot of guys who aren't five-star guys. Um, a coaching staff and Coach Beard who came from a mid-major and started out coaching, you know, random teams and has worked his way up. And a lot of our guys are the same way. So we just try to embrace that, you know, you know, we weren't the highest recruited guys, but that doesn't mean we can't compete with the best in the country. You know, we just try to work at it every day. You know, don't lose your chip represents that. Secrets in the dirt represents that. Just working for it every day. Chuck, I think that's you. Yeah, for Tariq and for, for Matt, you weren't here last year. But how much were you guys motivated to get back to the Elite Eight? Or actually, both of you guys were in your first NCAA tournaments. But the motivation that the team had to get back to this level, what was that like? And what was it like for you kind of buying into that process? Tariq, you want to take that first? Um, just the fact that knowing coming in, um, just knowing where the team before us had been um, was major for me. I knew I'd never played in the NCAA tournament. And um, the guys here who were had just experienced it. So um, I knew it was, big, it was big coming in and we were going to have to work for it. But um, it was something that I was willing to dedicate myself to. Um, and doing it with these guys, these guys coming in, I seen how dedicated they were, how hungry they were to get back to the point that they just were and go even further. So, um, you know, it just meant a lot to them and it means a lot to me. Matt. Yeah, coming in after they went to Elite Eight last year, you know, they told us stories and talked about how cool an experience it was, how fun it was to get to Elite Eight. And it just made us want to uh, experience that as well. And then, you know, we want to leave our legacy too, you know, um, just being here for one year. You know, we want to try to win the whole thing. We'll go in the very back. This will be the last question for the student athletes before we let them go back to the breakout rooms. Yeah, I'm Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Uh, Tariq, you have a degree in sport management, right? Would you hire Coach Beard and why? Would I hire Coach Beard? <laughs> uh, yeah, of course I would hire Coach Beard. Um, you know, since I've been here, uh, everything that he's told me would happen, um, you know, it's been true. And, you know, um, as the person I am, how I was raised, you know, I, I, I really like people who tell the truth. You know, I take pride in, you know, being a truthful person. So 
that's the biggest thing for me and Coach Beard. You know, he lives by that. But also how hard he works. Uh, his work ethic is, you know, unmatched. I've never seen anybody work as hard as him and his staff um, on this level of basketball. And that's the main thing that attracted me here. Um, you know, he, he just works so hard. He's a workaholic. And I, I really appreciate that coming from my head coach because I know how hard I'm willing to, to work to be successful. And he, he's willing to work even harder. So. All right, with that, we're going to let the student athletes go on back to their breakout rooms. And we'll open up. We'll give them a moment here. All right, questions for Coach Beard. Okay, I see two in the back. We're gonna go with the gentleman standing first, and then we'll go with the gentleman sitting, and we'll go right over here. Chris, David Collier from the ABC in Lubbock. Uh, you, you talk about four minute games, uh, 40 minute games uh, that you guys play. I know you were at this point last year, but how do you manage your team to not th let them get too high, knowing that they're that close to the school's first ever Final Four? You just stay, stay with your routine. Try to be who you are. Um, then ultimately, you got to trust your players. You know, as a coach, as a coach, you can only do so much. You know, but we're led by these four seniors. Uh, we have the experience, we have the maturity. But uh, yeah, it's like that fine line. You got to, you know, next game on a schedule, but you also got to live in the reality that you're playing. You know, you're 40 minutes from a Final Four, so. Um, I think ultimately you just you rely on your players, the leadership of your players, the voice in that locker room. And for me, you know, I sleep well at night these days because these four seniors uh, led by Norris, it's the best leadership I've ever coached. Before we go to the next question, would you like to introduce our guest? It's my youngest daughter, Margo. Welcome to the stage here. You have anything you would like to say? She's really good at questions, too, if anybody wants to give her a question. She's been around it her whole life. <laughs> All right, we have a question in the very back sitting there. Please, and then I see you guys up front here. Uh, one, one follow up, real quick, Coach. Uh, I, I noticed uh, Jim Rome posted you with a big bowl of Lucky Charms. Is that something that you eat pregame meal every morning, or is that a superstitious type deal, or is that just number one on the cereal hi hierarchy? Well, it starts my relationship with Jim Rome. So, like, I'm just a normal guy, man. I, you know, love college basketball, listen to the jungle and all that. Then, you know, we've had some good players and at least opportunities. And so we're at Little Rock and we had a special team, a championship team that won 30 games and won a game in this tournament. And, you know, I get a chance to be on the Jim Rome show. I told our SID, Patrick, at Little Rock, I was like, man, I just want to eliminate all distractions. I don't want to do any of this stuff. So he said, got it. And then he came back in. He goes, the next day, he's like, hey, I know you say you don't want to do anything, man, but Jim Rome. And I was like, yeah, I'll do Jim Rome. So I got on the show and uh, basically just told him a story that he didn't remember, but it's true. Like, there had been a Final Four at Phoenix years earlier, and I was uh, like a junior college coach, maybe D2, and we didn't have a hotel room. We just got down there, and we normally crash on guys' couches and this kind of thing. So we were at this hotel and um, just looking, you know, for maybe like a free buffet or something, and the elevator opens in this gym room. And so we're in the uh, elevator with him, and we kind of give him a little smack for what he was talking about the day before in his show, and he's a great dude. And so he's just like, hey, where are y'all from? So we told him the story that we had driven all night. We're at the Final Four. We don't have a hotel room or nothing. We were looking for something to eat. And so he gives us his key. He's like, hey, man, I'm on the top floor. Do not go in my room. But there's a concierge level up there. And he talks in third person, you know, a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I love Jim Romy. He goes, hey, go up there on the Romy, man, and, uh, you know, hit the concierge. So we went up there, and I'll never forget it. They had prime rib sliders, and they had little Ozarka waters and granola bars, and we just killed it, man. <laughs> And uh, so then years later, you know, like eight, nine years later, I'm on the Rome show and I, I told him the story and he vaguely kind of remembered it. So that's where our relationship is. So, but yeah, the whole idea with Lucky Charms, man, you know, like I've spent my whole life staying at like Courtyard Marriott's and Days Inns and they got the plastic things that you turn and the cereal comes down and you and I both know that cereal's stale, man. <laughs> but in these five-star hotels here, when you get to the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, man, they got like the Tiffany's bowl and the silver spoon. And so I told uh, Jim Rome that the other day, and then uh, somehow he got a picture of it. I'm not sure why. But I love Lucky Charms, big time cereal. Sitting in the back there, please. Uh, Reed Forgrave with uh, CBS Sports. Uh, two questions. I'm just going to ask like the first one. Um, 
I'm curious if you could trace your lineage of your defensive philosophy, like where that comes from, who are the, the key people that have that have helped you along the way, and, and who've sort of been your mentors? No, I just I've always I played for great coaches. I played for two high school Hall of Fame coaches in the state of Texas, Mike Kunstadt and Terry Priest. Uh, I was never a great player myself, so I mean I had to guard. If my man scored, I wasn't playing. Uh, and then, you know, growing up in Irving, we played outside at the Conflans at Northwest Rec and in the Woodlands. We played at the Y and Falco Wing Park. And, you know, you get out there and you, you call the next game. You might be three deep. And then if you get beat, you're done. If you win, you stay. And you got to play defense. And, you know, you can't score on a, you can't win on a foul. So you, that last possession gets down to where you'll guard and foul if you have to. But it just always kind of been in me as a player defensively. And I've worked for great coaches, Tom Penders with a pressing style defense, Danny Casper, one of the best defensive coaches in the country, currently the head coach of Texas State, and Shannon Hayes and Vic Trilly, and certainly with Coach Knight and Pat, we, we guarded at a high, high level. Uh, so it's always kind of been me. Then I get hooked up with Mark Adams on our staff, who deserves a lot of credit. And um, he's one of the best coaches I've ever known, and he is the best defensive coach I've ever been around. No disrespect to the other people that I know. Um, but Coach Adams has a great way of teaching. Uh, nobody works harder at it. He's an aggressive guy himself. Uh, he's done a great job for us both at Little Rock and here at Texas Tech. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, the follow-up to that is uh, when you get this job three years ago, how do you install? How do you go about installing that mentality? Because it does feel like that this team embraces that uh, to the nth degree. Well, first it's about recruiting. You know, we try to recruit guys that understand you are going to play defense. We're going to coach you. We're going to hold you accountable. Um, do a lot of listening and recruiting, not just talking. And players will tell you what they want. And guys that are talking about me, 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 and shots and ball, you know, not so much uh, with us. They don't really succeed. But guys that want to win, guys that want to guard, and guys that understand. You know, great example of that, Zaire Smith. He goes from being a non-top 100 recruit to the 16th pick in the draft. I mean, he didn't get drafted because he can't guard. You know, I thought he was the best defensive perimeter player in last year's draft. And um, so, I mean, defense is just who we are. It's our DNA. I don't think we're any different than most championship uh, contenders. Gonzaga plays defense, man. Uh, I'm telling you, it might not be their identity, but they are hard to score against. So many late shot clock possessions. Uh, you got to go get a basket if you're going to beat Gonzaga. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, think we, I think we guard, but I think a lot of other people do too. Okay, we're going to go to the gentleman in the black shirt, please, right there in the middle. Coach, uh, Eddie Pels from AP. I, I had two that are a little unrelated, but the first one was th there was a little exchange last night when some players were talking about not wanting to deal with Coach Adams if they don't play defense the right way, and you referenced Michigan State. And I, s I was wondering just what th your philosophy is on coaching hard which in some corners, especially last week, seemed to get criticized. Yeah, I think uh, all great players want to be coached. I've never coached a good player at any level that didn't want to be held accountable, that didn't want discipline, that didn't want to be told the truth, and that didn't want to play for a coach that brings it every single day. And I think in today's world, you know, somebody might get a clip of one isolated thing, but they don't know about the relationship that that coach has with that player, the trust, the bond, the love, and the expectations. Um, where I'm at my lowest as a coach is uh, it doesn't happen often, but when a player will be like, hey, coach, you okay today? You bringing it? That's when I just absolutely uh, am at my lowest. But I want my guys to know that we bring it every single day. And like this morning, I was a little tired. We worked hard last night, uh, but this morning, you know, I had to pop myself around, make sure those guys understood that we're here. Let's go, guys. We're doing this. Um, so I think, you know, I'm pretty sure all around the country, you know, uh, guys are getting coached at a high level. I think just sometimes things get caught in one isolated incident is my personal opinion on it. Any follow-up? And then the, the other one was, do, what do you – do you think that, like, it's mandatory that you have NBA caliber talent on your roster to keep getting this far every year? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the Big 12, especially, it's a talent. It's a talent uh, league. You got to get guys that can play. And, um, I think there's different ways to get that talent. I think obviously, you know, uh, some people can just recruit it. Other people have to develop it, and we all have to evaluate it. So, um, but yeah, we don't stray away from that. Our goal is to have a team at Texas Tech one day. Whoever got on the team's an NBA player. I think if we can do that, we'll be back up here eating Lucky Charms and hanging out with you. 
um, on a regular basis. But uh, yeah, no doubt about it. College basketball to play on this stage, you got to have you got to have pros. And to me, pros, you got to evaluate, recruit, and uh, develop. Right here in the second row. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. You knew Texas Tech well. You had chances to coach elsewhere. But Texas Tech had never made it to this level, and now you've done it two, two years in a row. Why did, did you think that this program could get to this level? And if so, what led you to believe that? Yes, I did. Um, it's a great university. It's a great college town. It's got great basketball tradition. Maybe not so much on the national scene uh, lately, but you know there was days when Coach Myers coached and played that you couldn't get a seat at the old Coliseum. Great players, great coaches have come before us. Certainly in my lifetime, James Dickey had a special team with Tony Batte, Corey Carr, Darvin Ham, uh, Lance Hughes, Sasser. These guys were good, man. Remember they broke the backboard against North Carolina. Coach Dickey was big time coach. And uh, with Coach Knight, I'm really proud of our run, three NCAA tournaments, NITs, championships. Um, had a great game with Gonzaga one time in Arizona uh, in a sweet uh, round of 32 game. Um, and then, you know, Coach Smith, Tubby Smith, I uh, can't speak enough of him, the foundation that we inherited, the discipline, the defense, the talent, the character in the program. Uh, but absolutely, I believed uh, that Texas Tech could be a part of the fight every year. And that's what we're trying to do. Just want to be a part of the fight. I think if you're – if you're in the fight long enough, eventually you're going to win it. We'll go in the check shirt right there. Jackson Frank, Gonzaga Bulls. And your players gave a little insight into to Jared's growth this year, but I'm wondering where you've seen him make the most strides in his game from last year to, to being the Big 12 player of the year now. Yeah, I think threefold with Culver. One, physically. He's continued to gain weight and change his body. Uh, he basically has a pro body now or on his way towards that. Spent a lot of time in the weight room and conditioning. Uh, number two, just his uh, skill development. Uh, he's a great passer now. He can, you know, he can beat you with the pass or the shot or the rebound. Uh, so he's added some things to his game. It's what great players do, right? In my lifetime, you know, Jordan comes in the league, slasher, leaves the league, best three-point shooter in the league. Uh, Kobe, back of the basket game. LeBron does it all. Like, you know, stuff, great passer, not just shooter. Like, guys get better. Culver's done that. He, he thinks he has this ceiling. I agree with him. Uh, then thirdly, just he studies the game. He knows a lot about his opponent. He knows a lot about uh, himself. He knows a lot about what's going on in the, the, the NBA. He knows a lot about what's going on. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he'd seen Gonzaga play 10 or 15 times this year on his laptop. He just loves the game, loves it. Any more questions for Coach Beard? You guys going to let Margo off this easy? Margo, what do you think about uh, Margo, your, how do you feel your about dad? It's a Marge game with Gonzaga. How do we feel about Gonzaga? Obviously, we respect them a lot. They're one of the best teams in college basketball, and it's going to be one of the best games in college basketball history. There you go. Yeah. That was impressive right there. <laughs> Maybe one of the best games in this year's tournament history, Adam, but I, I like it. That's what you said. Yeah, I like it where you are. <laughs> Any closing statement you'd like to make? Margo, closing either, either one of you? No, it's been great. Like, to, from a coach's standpoint, I man, you just want to live another day. But I'm just so excited. We're about to practice again. This time of year, you just get scared that you might not be able to coach those seniors again. So I'm going to enjoy the next hour more than I'll enjoy the game tomorrow. It's just coaching these guys again. Thank you, Coach. Thanks. We'll see you tomorrow. Good job, Mark. <laughs> So Gonzaga will start off at 340. Again, the student athletes will be Zach Norvell Jr., Corey Kispert, Rui Hachimura, Josh Perkins, and Brandon Clark. Can you like put them in that order, please? Okay. That'll work. It just Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do it.
All right, we're about two minutes out from the uh, Gonzaga press conference. We'll be joined by student athletes Zach Norville Jr., Corey Kispert, Rui Hachimura, Josh Perkins, Brandon Clark, and head coach Mark Few. Uh, we will let them loose to the breakout rooms at 4.05, where they will be joined by Killian Tilly. The room assignments for the breakout rooms, Zach Norvell Jr. will be in room one, Corey Kispert and Killian Tilly in room two, Rui Hachimura in room three, Josh Perkins in room four, and Brandon Clark in room five. And that will go from 4.05 to 4.20. The locker room will be open as soon as uh, the press conference begins. Uh, for those of you looking for the satellite information for this press conference, same as it has been, Galaxy 17, Transponder 14B, download frequency 11975.5, V as in Victor. We'll once again follow the format that we followed in past press conferences. The only real difference in this one is that we have all five starters and Coach Few. So for the time that the student athletes are up here, I ask that we try to do as many questions to them as possible uh, in the time allotted. Uh, a reminder, please turn off your cell phones, or tell, cell phone ringers, that is. Uh, also, you may take still photos, no video. Raise your hand, I'll call on you in the order in which I see you. Please wait for the microphone before asking your question, and please identify yourself and your affiliation uh, prior to asking your question. Uh, we have Tony, Aaron, and Les will be taking care of the sonography, and we'll have the quotes to the interview room up on the server and to the interview or to the media room within a few minutes at the conclusion of the press conference. And we'll let you know when everybody's en route. So everybody is on route and the locker room is open if anybody wants to head on over there. They're on the far side of the building. alphabetical order, sorry. Can we get a cup? Let me get you a cup, Rui. Alrighty, welcome to the Bulldogs. Coach, we'll start off with a statement from you and then we'll go open to questions. Go ahead. Well, we're uh, thrilled to uh, still be alive and, and playing in the tournament and actually probably more so than that to still be together and, and practicing and have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to play another game against a, a, a very, very uh, worthy opponent. So uh, uh, we feel great about getting by the one last night and, and looking forward to a, to a a, a great battle uh, tomorrow night. Joseph, your hand was up first. Go for it. Uh, Joseph DiPolito from The Answer in Japan. I'd like to ask all of you a two-part question. First, how has uh, Rui Yachimura improved on and off the court from last season to this season? What specific areas? And secondly, how would you describe his personality? That's a really broad question. I'm going to direct ask Brandon to start and just work your way down. Yeah, you know, I would say this year he's just playing like like a lot more physical. I would say, 
Um, he also just has like a lot more trust in his game, so um, I just feel like the game has just come come to him a lot more more easy than it, it did last year. Um, and also, he's just like a really really funny guy, uh, really really goofy too. So uh, always always fun to you know uh, chill with him and just play play basketball with him. Uh, yeah, I'd say he go along with Brandon. Uh, he's a much more um, confident leader for us, um, and he's learned how to use his voice. Um, and he's learned how to echo the calls and, and be a vocal leader out there on the floor for us. And then to kind of relate that to the off the floor, his English is so much better this year than it was last year. Um, it just makes it that much more fun to be around. And, um, you know, we enjoy, we enjoy hanging out with each other. Uh, yeah, just pretty much his confidence. You know, uh, we came in here as freshmen together. So, you know, just not knowing so much English, so, you know, understanding a little bit more the plays and stuff like that. And uh, just off the quarter, you know, a really good guy, really funny. And, uh, you know, humble doesn't really – talk too much about basketball, just, you know, day-to-day -day life stuff. I mean, these guys tackled everything. You know, I think when I first, you know, met Rudy, he's a passive guy who was letting me sit in the front seat, you know, because of, I don't I have no idea reason, uh, no idea why. But I was like, Rudy, you're six foot eight. Like, I don't need to sit in the front, you know what I mean? Um, so now he's just this confident dude who believes in himself. I mean, he's an animal, and it shows on the court and then off the court. You know, he's one of our brothers. You know, somebody you can talk to about anything. He's a fun dude. and. Really, just somebody who's always going to do the right thing when somebody's not watching. So, uh, quality, quality teammate, quality guy. Coach, you want to address anything about his development? I think he's worse now that he got here. <laughs> 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 no, uh, it's been, he's been great. He's been so coachable and uh, just a diligent, diligent, hard worker. Uh, the, the amount of uh, work both in the classroom, learning uh, English, and then the, the basketball that was laid upon his shoulders was, was epic. <laughs> and uh, he always handled it with a smile and, and such grace. He's a wonderful teammate. Uh, he's an awesome role model. I have a lot of uh, kid. My kids are young, and they hang out uh, around the program. So uh, it's been an absolute joy to uh, – Kind of watch his development and and uh, watch him grow. Okay, we're gonna go all the way in the back in the white in the corner, please. Uh, Reed Forgrave with CBS Sports. Question for Josh, um, straight in the back. Okay. Um, yeah, what, can you describe the challenges uh, of learning to be a point guard in Coach Few's system, where there's you know a pretty intricate offense with a lot of movement to it? Uh, is, is challenges there were, Coach? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's difficult, you know. Um, a lot of different reads, um, a lot of different, you know, personnel, a lot of different players that you play with. Um, but I think, you know, my hat goes off the coach, you know, from day one. He's been somebody, you know, I could ask questions to about the game, of how I can be more comfortable running the team. Um, and, you know, from the get-go, he said, you know, I could, I could run it. And he's believed in me, you know, since day one. So I don't know if challenging was the word, but I know uh, throughout this whole process, he's been somebody who's, you know, been supportive. And uh, really, you know, my confidence, you know, thrives through him. Got some Reed folks in the Zoom. Uh, I'm going to start with Zach and then Brandon. But it's about Culver. I'm going to assume that you'll take the challenge uh, to start off defending him. What's, what makes him so dangerous, and what are some of the ways you can slow him down? Uh, the, he's just, a, you know, he's a weapon. You know, when he crosses half court, understanding that he can, uh, you know, handle it, you know, shoot it, make plays for others and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, just the biggest thing is, you know, try to change up you know, different defensive schemes on him and stuff like that, you know, uh, challenge all his shots and uh, just make things tough for him. Yeah, you know, um, I've been watching him play, you know, uh, lots of games this year, and, you know, he has a really, really quick first step. Um, he can also shoot it pretty well. Um, obviously, he's uh, uh, pretty uh, bouncy, too, so, um, you know, uh, definitely going to, like, demand the best out of our bigs in the paint. Um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, going to be a, a, a fun team effort playing versus him tomorrow. More questions? Right here in the third row, please. Jackson Frank, Gonzaga Bulletin. This one is for Corey. I don't know if you remember, but yesterday after your dunk in the second half, you you kissed your hands or you smelled your hands or something. I'm curious, is that a celebration? What was going on there? It's kind of a it's kind of a team inside joke. It's like a, um, I don't know. It's like what James Harden does when he goes and dunks on someone. It's like you're up so high that your no your nose starts to bleed a little bit, and so you know like. <laughs> Yeah, the altitude, you're up so high. So I was kind of checking to see if my nose was bleeding a little bit, trying to copy James Harden. And was it? No, no. <laughs> clean, clean nose. We're good. 
More questions? Right there on the edge on the white, please. Uh, Duke Nguyen, LA Daily News. This is for Zach. Um, Josh was just talking about the challenges the, about being a point guard here. What about his personality and his skill set make him the perfect point guard for this team and this offense? Uh, he's a people person. You know, he can he can get along with everybody. Uh, when he walks in a room, you know, he's really confident with himself. You know, the, and I think that helps the team the team out a lot. You know, understanding that you know, we have a leader who's you know he's confident in his abilities, and uh, everybody here. You know, sees him put in work day in and day out. So, you know, having trust and belief in this guy, you know, seeing all the work he put in, uh, you have no choice but to follow his lead. And, uh, you know, I think he takes all the, the media and all the, you know, the stuff that comes with it, you know, right on the chin. He doesn't, you know, shy away from it at all, understanding that, you know, he, he's leading uh, a top program, you know, every, every day in and day out. So uh, he's, he's handled it pretty well. We'll go in the back in the, I think that's gray, bluey gray. A uh, question for Brandon, and I guess any other players want to jump in, too. Uh, I don't know how much you yeah, identify yourself. Sorry. Sorry, Kirk from TSN in Canada. My apologies. Um, just wondering how much you guys saw of the Michigan-Texas Tech game yesterday. Uh, clearly, their defense gave Michigan fits. I'm just wondering how you guys try and break through and make sure that they aren't able to do the same thing against you guys. Yeah, I know. I think uh, I watched most of the second half. Um, obviously, it was a really, really physical game in the paint. Um, I feel like Michigan kind of lacked running in transition, which is something that we're, we're going to really want to do tomorrow. Um, I just feel like uh, they just couldn't, couldn't really score on uh, their like, touches in the paint either, and they, they weren't really shooting well from, from three. So they're just kind of struggling to find ways to you know, score. But um, I feel like that, that's stuff that we're, we're great as, as a team, so uh, we should be, be fine tomorrow. Sounds like a future coach. Anybody else want to uh, touch on that? BC, you nailed it. Good job. Uh, I want to ask a question of Rui. Rui, you've got uh, a lot of media here watching you. There's a lot of people back home rooting for you, even though basketball isn't as huge a sport in Japan. How does it feel to kind of be the center of attention, maybe not here, right here, but back home? Um, I'm just blessed to be here, you know. Um, I'm so happy. You know, I'm, I'm still playing basketball. At this point, I'm still playing basketball with these great people and, you know, I'm just enjoying this moment, and yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I'm gonna ask another one. Uh, Coach, tell us a little bit about the process that you and the team go through after a game like last night. Obviously, you, you're used to playing, playing a game, having a day, playing a game, but does yeah. it change at all at this level? Uh, I mean, it's, it, I think it was similar to maybe what we do in our league. This is very similar to how our league is. We'll play a game on a Thursday and then uh, you know, usually get back to the hotel and have a film session or at least an information session. And then, uh, you know, get them up the next day and a couple film sessions and, and then head out and, and practice. And then uh, these guys will go out uh, to dinner tonight together and then we'll have one more film session uh, uh, tonight. And, and uh, that'll be it. These, th th this has been an unbelievable group. Uh, you know, and I've been blessed with some extraordinary groups, but these guys have been unbelievable about uh, assimilating the amount of information we're given to them and then taking it out into action uh, out on the floor. They're, they're, they all have, and not just these guys, but the rest of the guys in the locker room have really good uh, understanding of basketball and feel for the game. And, and uh, that makes our job, the coach's job, a lot easier and also allows us to kind of do some more things and try some more things. So uh, these guys, it, it, it's, it's been great in that, that regard. We're going to do a question in the third row in the blue, please. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Brandon, did you have any doubts that your game would translate to this level, or did you have to make any adjustments for your game to adjust so well to this level? Um, I wouldn't say doubts, really, no. Um, you know, there were times when I was, like, um, I would say nervous, I guess, because, you know, it was just different, you know, playing for a team that was, you know, uh, trying to play for something bigger than I was kind of used to at the time. Um, but you know, after you know, not not playing last year and just having lots of days to like practice and to like work out, um, it was it was fine after like the, the first couple months. So um, I was just you know really really hungry to to play on the on the court again, and I'm just glad that it's here and that it's been such a great season for us. On the edge in the white, please. Coach Josh has played in more games than pretty much everyone in the country now. Uh, when, when you have a guy like that, that experience on the floor, what luxuries does that give you as a head coach? Is that, is that true? Is that a, a true statistic or just kind of, okay? Uh, yeah, 
Hey, hey, listen, Josh has pretty much at this point uh, in his career seen everything and, and uh, experienced everything. I mean, you start a point guard in the national championship game uh, and, and, and log a bunch of minutes, and I think he had 13 or 15 at half, you know, under the brightest of lights. I mean, that, yeah, that's a, obviously quite a luxury to have as a, as a coach and then also as teammates. Uh, and, and so, again, it's just about kind of getting him right and ready for the moment and understanding the plan and then uh, him going out and executing it. Here we go. Back in the blue, please. Justin Reed, Spokesman Review. Mark, Josh is the only one up there who played in the final four games two years ago. How do you explain what that feeling is to be able to... I thought I got the picture <laughs> <laughs> to be able to make it to that pinnacle and to, and to play in those games. What's that? How do, you, how do you explain it to the rest of the guys, what it feels like to get to that point? Uh, you know, we're not explaining anything. We're just explaining how to, how to beat Texas Tech right now. I mean, that's 100% what it, we're dialed into. Just, you know, figuring out ways to attack this uh, defense that's, you know, I think ranked number one in the country. And then also... Uh, you know how to defend in, in, a, in a short time of preparation, you know motion offense that you just don't see much. Uh, so uh, that's 100% what we're focused in on is just the task at hand. We're not really talking final fours or anything like that. Josh, has anybody talked to you about that? I'm sorry, right? Sorry, got my, my people mixed up. Has anyone talked to you about the experience uh, of being in the final four before? Not Josh. Yeah, no, him. Josh has yeah. Been, yeah. Oh, sorry. Give my all my people mixed up. Yeah. Has anyone have any of your teammates spoken to you about the experience or what they can expect, both here and moving on into if you guys move on in the next game? I mean, honestly, you know, at the beginning of the year, you know, it's, it's a goal we set for ourselves. So other than that, um, not really. You know, we've been focused on you know each opponent. You know that we're going to get you know every team's best um, in these in these single game tournaments throughout you know March. Um, so that's been our you know our sole our sole focus right now. Um, but if we take care of our, you know, our, our business tomorrow, then we can have that talk, and I'm looking forward to doing that. We're gonna go standing in the back in the blue. Paul Tubbs, the CBS station in Lubbock, Texas. Guys, and any one of you can answer this question. You know, Texas Tech's been able to hold most of the opposition the postseason, close to 25 points under their average on the season. Uh, what do they do that kind of poses so many problems, and uh, and how do you guys address that? Jo I'll just say, you know, uh, you know, just be confident in ourselves. You know, we've been scoring at a high rate all year. So, you know, just do the things that, that's been working for us. Don't try to, you know, switch anything up or, you know, very often, you know, things get a little mucked up, understanding that, you know, they do have a high level defense, but, you know, understanding that it's, it's a lot of plays in the game. So, you know, just trying to stay the course. Don't get, you know, too big headed or anything in a situation. You just try to stay level headed and, uh, you know, keep the same plan of attack that we came into the game with. We're going to go to the blue right there. Justin Reed, Spokesman Review. So a lot of the media, you know, they point at the number one offense. Uh, you guys actually have a better defensive efficiency rating than both Michigan and Texas Tech. Do you guys feel like you have to uh, answer some of those doubts on as to uh, your defensive play and trying to reach the offense's level as well? Yeah, no, offense has been stellar all year long. Um, but that hasn't been the case for our defense uh, from beginning to end. We've had to work really hard to... Um, get our defense to the level that we wanted to, and it's been a slow process and a slow build up until this point. But I think all the guys uh, sitting here and all the guys in the locker room are, are really confident in our defense, and uh, we feel like we can stop anybody in the country. Yeah, I, I would say our defense has won the first three games so far for us in this tournament. I mean, that's that's been the one consistent thing. I mean, we played pretty good offense, but our defense has been stellar, in my opinion. Time for a couple more questions for the student athletes if anybody wants them. I, I do want to ask one question. Um, is there any message uh, that any, any of you gentlemen would like to give ab about the existence of Gonzaga to any people who might live in Southern California? Yeah. Yeah, come to Spokane, you'll love it. <laughs> That's it. Fair enough. All right, we're going to let the student athletes head off to the breakout rooms. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, uh, Zach Norvell Jr. will be in room one. Corey Kispert and Killian Tilly will be in room two. Rui Hachimura in room three. Josh Perkins in room four. Brandon Clark in room five. We'll give you all a chance to settle, and then we'll open it back up with Coach Hugh.
We're going to go to the gentleman in the hat. We'll go to the gentleman in the blue and then the gentleman in the white. Mark, Brian Hamilton from The Athletic. Um, I, I know all those guys on Texas Tech side can play some defense, but Absolutely. specifically Matt Mooney, their grad transfer, what do, you, what do you think he adds to their mix on that end of the floor? Uh, I mean, well, first he adds a real shot maker and playmaker and, and just a uh, uh, crafty element uh, to the team that I think is so necessary when you are playing, you know, five-man motion and, 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 and a motion game. But uh, I've been really impressed with just how handsy he is. He's very handsy. He gets his hands on a lot of balls and knocks them loose or creates steals. And, and uh, uh, I think that, that, that's a huge part of their offense is how many turnovers they – or their defense, excuse me, how many turnovers they generate just in the half court. Go ahead. Kurt Burmester from TSN in Canada. Uh, Coach, we heard Brandon talking about uh, working out and that year he had to go through. How rewarding is it to see a guy like him have the success and then be on this team that's advancing so far after the work you know he's put in like that to get there? Uh, I mean, it's it's great. It's it's you know it's kind of what it's supposed to be all about when you're coaching, right? I mean, your 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 goal is to make these guys you know, as good as they can possibly be and help them to get, you know, where they can reach the, the goals that they set for themselves, whether it's, you know, being an elite player in college and, and moving on and playing in the NBA. And, and uh, so uh, it's been awesome to be part of, of his development. There's still a lot of tons of room for growth in his development. He's, he's still very much uh, on an upward uh, swing. And uh, the, the neat thing is he's been very coachable. And the other interesting thing is, you know, both Rui and Brandon, and here they are, these, you know, incredible players, but they're so humble and so deferential to, you know, sometimes too much even on the floor still. Uh, it, it's pretty cool to see in this day and age. Reed, I think that's you back there. Yep, uh, Reed Forgrave, CBS Sports HQ. Um, long-winded question. I'd love a long-winded answer. Um, I'm curious if you could kind of detail the lineage of your offensive philosophy, wh where, it, uh, where it first came from and then how it's <coughs> progressed and changed over the years. Oh, wow, that's a great question. I, I would just say it, it first came from, you know, maybe watching some of our older teams when I was uh, at a young assistant at Gonzaga, and we were pretty rigid, pretty tight, would look at the bench a lot uh, after a missed shot or a mistake. And, uh, you know, I always, if I was ever to become head coach, I wanted my guys to play with a bunch of confidence and a bunch of freedom and just, you know, drill them down in practice so they knew what to look for, what to expect, and, and how to react. But once we got in games, you just kind of let it rip. I think those are the hardest teams to, to guard. Obviously, uh, you know, very, very um, into playing up tempo and and playing transition basketball. I mean, that's what I love to watch and love to coach. And so all of our teams have been real good about that. But I mean, very, very concerned with taking care of the ball. That's a big stat for us. And then uh, you know, shooting a high percentage shot. Technically, it's went from flex <laughs> early to some motion to a bunch of high-low through the Turioff years and, uh, when we were getting, you know, the, the bigs like Roney and some people like that to, uh, you know, then eventually we kind of got into some ball screen uh, action that we, you know, have stuck with that's been very, very good for us. Uh, but all the while still kind of sticking with our high-low because that's been the bread and butter of our program for quite a while now. Jackson, go ahead. Justin Reed, Spokesman Review. Uh, so I asked Zach and, and Brandon this already, but – uh, kind of two parts. Culver is obviously a really good talent. Uh, what are some of the things he does really well, and is there really anything you can do to slow him down? You just kind of have to mediate him. Yeah, he's tough to slow down because he does pretty much, I don't, I don't know that he has a weakness. He shoots it from deep. He's got a really good mid-range game, much like uh, Rui has, that are just kind of rare, and, you know, in this day and age. Uh, he's big and athletic. He's a good finisher, you know, in that regard, his body and kind of game reminds me of R.J. Barrett a little bit who we've played against. Uh, 
but man, he also uh, excellent passer, sets his teammates up, and and he's got a huge uh, usage rate on the offensive end. So the ball's in his hands a lot, and it's leading to baskets or free throws or or things like that. And and you know they surround him with a lot of skill, so it's hard to help from different spots. Chris does a good job of getting him in the ball in different spots and places where uh, you know you can't just key in on it. Uh, so it's tough. I mean, we we kind of went through and through over and over about maybe some things we could do, but uh, he, he's 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 a definitely a, a tough tough guard and a tough matchup. We're gonna go here in the middle, and then we'll go back. Yeah, um, Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Um, not many coaches get a twentieth tournament as you're as you're in this time, and um, I was just wondering, the first one when you were a head coach. And, and you're you're going, I think, to Albuquerque, and you're up against Denny Crum, you know, royalty. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'd just been to the Elite Eight as, as an assistant, at, you know, before. But what do you remember about that that stands out, and, and how might you critique that coach from back then? Uh, should have called a timeout at altitude. Uh, I think we played Purdue, maybe. And uh, uh, we were winning at the time and running up and down, but we only had six guys, and, and uh, we had one of those – runs where there was no stoppage of play uh and then by the time they got to the bench they were just out of gas and uh, so i, I kind of always remember that especially when we play it at a high altitude um i would just say i remember feeling a lot of pressure uh in our conference tournament back then because in those days you know i don't know that we would have made the ncaa tournament to keep this streak going if we didn't win our conference tournament, and uh, uh, we beat an amazing uh, uh, Pepperdine team that year that went on, that handed Bobby Knight his last loss at Indiana, it was like by 30. And uh, I mean, I think we won in overtime, and, and it was just a war. Uh, and that was, you know, that's kind of what got this whole thing going. Uh, and it, and a little bit like this group, once we got in the tournament, we know we had experience of what to expect with Santangelo's and Fromm's and Calvary's and uh, and got in and played played really really well. We got through the first weekend, made it to a Sweet 16. So that was that was uh, something. And what would he say back to you? Uh, who that that guy? Yeah. Uh, uh, good question. <laughs> Uh, he would probably admit, yeah, I screwed up. I should have called a timeout, <laughs> and uh, you were right. <laughs> Justin, go ahead. Uh, Justin Reed, spokesman. Uh, I assume that Zach would be taking at least the first assignment on Culver. Is is that the case? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it depends. They play a small lineup. They pay a, play a big lineup. So, um, you know, we'll have different coverages and different matchups, you know, based on that. But, yeah, Snacks has done a nice job, you well, know, thus far. Uh, looking specifically at Zach, what uh, what can he bring to the defensive end against Culver? What can he do well that might uh, help your guys' defense against him? Uh, again, I, I it's hard to guard Culver one on one, and it, we're, we're literally this isn't a coaching cliche, but we're gonna have to guard him as a team, um, and we switch a lot too. So, uh, uh, but I mean, it, uh, Zach's bigger guard, um, he's moving his feet better. He's he's became so much better at attention to detail with scouting reports and, and our coverages. So that's why we trust him so much on guarding so many of these good players. Go ahead. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Mark, when, just when you, you've had international players now for so long, when, are there things that you do as a coaching staff or as a, uh, as a school to try to make make guys that are you know coming from you know different cultures, different countries feel a little bit more at home. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we first of all, there's a trust involved there with just the track record of all the success all our you know our players from other countries have had, and so they can look up there and and just see how well those other players' careers went. Um, I think there's definitely an understanding within our staff and actually within our school about, you know, this is different. These guys are thousands and thousands of miles away from home and immersed in a totally different culture. And so I think a, 
everybody understands that and, and uh, uh, really you know, reaches out and makes them feel at home and part of a family. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we're always very, very cooperative with the national teams, you know, that and don't demand that. I mean, I just assume these guys not go to summer school and, and play on their national teams and, you know, and not stay at Gonzaga and work out with us. I'd rather see them, you know, uh, again, with my involvement in USA Basketball, I think that's a really, really valuable development piece is getting out there and competing in those uh, – uh, international tournaments and it also means so much to you know to those kids and the players to play for their home country so we're, we're very cooperative with that our school's cooperative with you know if they have to miss you know a week or so of school coming back in uh, September because of those things too go ahead last night when the score got to 60 to 56 and you missed two front ends right yeah. before that yeah. seemed scary to a to a witness, anyway, I was wondering if you, um, if, if you knew your team had in it, if you knew by now your team had in it what it showed right after that, or if you wondered even slightly. Uh, no, I knew, I knew they had it in them, but I don't know if they were going to show it, but I, I knew they had it in them. They've weathered many a storms, uh, you know, over the years. You go all the way back with how long Perk has been here, and then, you know, those other – Guys played significantly last year, obviously, and even this year. You know, we've had Baylor made a great run at us in the in the uh, second game of the tournament. Uh, Duke made a legendary run at us over in Maui uh, at the end of a game uh, where we missed a bunch of free throws and they came roaring back and we were able to to hold them off. So, you know, you just try to put them in the right spots, make the right call with what we're doing defensively and make the right call to what we're doing offensively and let them play and, and believe in them. And, and uh, you know, they, they made a lot of big plays down the stretch because uh, Florida State's not an easy team to, to try to close out. You know, there's just no rhythm on offense because they take you out everything. And, and uh, you know, they're so uh, dangerous with their athleticism and, and uh, length on the glass and around the hoop on the offensive end. Go ahead. I was just wondering if you could maybe just describe some of the, the you know, two very good defensive teams that you're going to be playing here and maybe what just some of the differences are between Florida State and uh, yeah. Texas Tech. Yeah. Well, again, uh, I mean, I think one question came up about how they hold points down and all that. I mean, this is not going to be a high-scoring game <laughs> tomorrow. You know, usually it takes two to tango. In, in pace of play and things like that. So, you know, we understand that. We've played in, you know, uh, many games this year where, you know, the tempo probably hasn't been at, at, at the speed we like to. Florida State likes to run up and down. I mean, they're more than happy to run up and down, but their their defense is every bit and good in kind of a full court essence. They're going to press you, trap you, deny every pass. Uh, so long, so athletic. Uh, Texas Tech's is just tough as nails. Don't make a mistake. Don't miss an assignment. Really gap oriented. Uh, down and ice and ball screens really hard. Uh, with all their help built in and a real conviction to, uh, you know, to guard you uh, as a team. And uh, it's tough. I mean, they don't give you any easy shots. And like I said earlier, they're very handsy. And then they you know, attempt uh, to take a lot of charges, too. They, you know, jump up and fall down on all the drives and all that, and you just got to kind of navigate your way through that. Any more questions? Just in time. Come on in. Right there. In the mic. Give him the mic. Could you talk a bit about uh, Donnie Daniels and what he's meant to this team and your, and your staff since coming on board? Yeah, Donnie's been great, man. I mean, Donnie, I, I wish somebody would do a story on Donnie, just the experiences. He's, he's got enough experiences to write a book. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, he was down here in the L.A. area and played at Cal State Fullerton and and, uh, and then worked for Rick Majerus all those years. I mean, that should take up the majority of the book right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... And then went on from Rick Majerus to work for Ben Allen down here during the run uh, uh, with all the Final Fours 
uh, at UCLA. I mean, his uh, number of Final Fours he's been involved in as a coach, as an assistant, has got to be I – don't, I don't know how anybody else could have any more. Uh, so he's definitely got an incredible winning karma and quality about him. Uh, unbelievable person. Uh, makes everybody feel good uh, about him. And, and uh, his experience, again, he's seen so many things and been a part of so many things, has been uh, been a huge. Follow-up, go ahead. I could, I, you used to go head-to-head -head with yeah. him in recruiting, <laughs> yes. so what, what's it been like to add him to your staff in that capacity? Well, it was good. I mean, I used to dread whenever I – it seemed like when he was at Utah, well, I mean, uh, uh, we were knocking – uh, heads time and time again because at that time they really targeted the same kind of people we targeted back, uh, you know, those Utah teams. And they were tough to beat. Man, they were tough to beat in recruiting. They were so diligent, so hard working. They seemed like they were everywhere all the time. Uh, so that's been good to not have to run into them <laughs> on the road and finally have them on our team. Go ahead. This side. Oh. Hey, Mark. Um, Eddie Pels from AP. That I think last week it might have been Bayheim who said um, nobody's ever going to the NBA based on their defense. It was when they were asking about recruiting to play defense. Do you, uh, not to make you diss on Bayheim, but do you buy into that? Uh... I mean, I think, first of all, he knows better than all of us here. I mean, he's got more experience and had more NBA guys and been around more NBA guys, uh, especially with all the USA basketball experience he has and talking to those people. I mean, I think that's a, a, a pretty valid point that you're probably going to get drafted more on your offensive expertise and what you can do on that end of the floor. But I think you can also eliminate yourself from – being drafted and moving on by not being able to play on, you know, the defensive end of the floor. So I would say, you know, yes to most of it, but probably no to part of it because I think I think it's something that can easily keep you out of the league if you if you, if you don't. Coach, I wanted to ask you just regarding this. You've you've been in twenty of these. Um, has this time had a few more distractions, a few, or, or how have you guys been able to handle the little extra media attention that you've received? Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, having done it so many times, it, it, it's great to, uh, for the staff, for the players like Perkins and, and uh, even Norvell and, and uh, Rui to a certain extent, that you know, they're, they're very used to it. So the shock of the NCAA tournament and the amount of media attention and the amount of time devoted to that is kind of old hat to everybody. And then just this, you know, Gonzaga, the administration is so used to it. And, uh, you know, our, uh, our SID, Barry and everybody, they, they really understand how to keep it as best to a minimum uh, for our guys and, and even for me in, in uh, many cases where those first years when uh, whoever was asking me about that, it was – yeah, we were like kids in a candy store. We were just eating it up and saying yes to every interview, you know. <laughs> and and uh, now we're uh, a little more selective and, and uh, probably better at saying no. And you, anything you want to say to close things out? Uh, no, listen, it's going to be a really, really tough game. I mean, we knew when the, when the bracket uh, popped up, uh, gosh, it to be two weeks ago tomorrow uh, or Sunday that – this was just going to be one of the, th those brackets, I mean, where you're going to have to fight like crazy. It's not going to be pretty, uh, but we got to enjoy the fight and embrace it. And, and uh, you know, to be sitting here 40 minutes away from another Final Four is, uh, you know, an awesome feeling and an awesome space to be in, and, and it's going to require our best. So I think the, the guys are, are ready and, and excited. All right. Thank you, Coach. We're going to wrap it up there. Yep.